Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Herbert Marshall in Sorrel and Son with Richard Carlson and Karen Morley. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Our first greetings of 1940. Tonight in the Lux Radio Theater, we dedicate our play to fathers everywhere. If the father in your own household looks a little incredulous when he hears this, you mustn't blame him. We've had so many fine plays about mothers lately that we haven't paid much attention to fathers. But tonight, in celebration of the new year, we turn over a new leaf and give you Sorrel and Son, the moving drama of a man and his boy, adapted from the novel by Warwick Deeping. Perhaps we've also slighted the gentlemen in our audience by addressing ourselves to the ladies when we talked about Lux Flakes. Of course, they're the ones who use it. But after all, it's the men who notice the pleasant effect of Lux Flakes on the feminine wardrobe and the family budget. In tonight's drama, Captain Stephen Sorrell had only one thing to live for, the welfare of his son, Kit. And to that end, he devoted his life. In the role of Stephen Sorrell, we give you an actor who seems perfect for the character, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Whenever I talk with Bart Marshall about playing a part, he gets that ocean-going gleam in his eye. You see, our first association was making a picture in Hawaii, and I think he's always hoping that lightning will strike twice in the same place. For Sorrel and Son, however, he came entirely by land from the RKO Studios, where he's starring in a bill of divorcement. In the part of The Son, we have two actors. Clifford Seven, Jr. will be Kit as a child, and Richard Carlson will play Kit as a young man, old enough to fall in love. For the role of Dora, we have Miss Karen Morley. We now subtract 20 years from the calendar as we begin the drama of Sorrel and Son, starring Herbert Marshall as Stephen Sorrel, Richard Carlson as Kit, and Karen Morley as Dora. The curtain rises on Act One. The guns of the World War were silent at last. A million British troops turned wearily from the blood-stained fields of France and looked hopefully toward England, eager to begin again their shattered lives. But a strange new order awaited them at home. A world gone mad, a money-grabbing, material world where power and position were worth far more than decorations for bravery. Some managed to find a place in this new order, but others were left far behind, without jobs, without money, confused and baffled by the mad scramble for existence. One of these was Captain Stephen Sorrow, M.C. Captain Stephen Sorrow, Military Cross. That should mean something, but it doesn't. Decorations are forgotten now. Stephen Sorrow educated at Eton and Oxford. That's a little better. Except that it isn't what you know anymore. It's what you've done. I've got to realize that I've got to take my place in this scramble everybody's got into. This new job ought to help. It isn't much, but when you start at the bottom, you've at least got the satisfaction of knowing you can't drop any further. The main thing is to keep your feet and not get trampled in the dust. Thank heaven I've only got one kid. Father, are you busy? Hmm? No, 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 I was just thinking. It's almost train time, son. Got that bag ready? I wish you'd help me. Sit on it, sir. Here. We'll try it together. Now. There we are. Thanks, Father. It will need label, won't it? Of course. Sorrel and Son. Passengers from London. Destination Staunton. Where are we going to live in Staunton, sir? Oh, we'll get a room somewhere. Or perhaps Mr. Verity might want us to live over the shop. Oh. It's a nice shop, from what I understand. Antiques, works of art. Quite a respectable business. Oh, yes, sir. I know. Wouldn't have anything else. Shall I go to school at Staunton, Father? Of course. I expect there'll be a grammar school there. Will it be a gentleman's school, Father? Oh, yes, we must see to that. Now, all ready? Yes, sir. Well, last look around, eh? Father? 
Mm-hmm. Have we lived in this house a very long time, Father? Let's see, a year before the war, four years after. A long time for you, Kit. All your life. Did my... Did Mother live in this house, too, Father? Yes. I knew she must have. I wish I could remember, sir. What is it, Kit? I... I don't know, sir. But we're leaving here for good, you said. Never coming back. And you feel... You're leaving her behind, is that it? Yes, sir. I know. Look, Kit, just think of her, of your mother, as someone who once loved you very much. Someone you would have loved very much if she was still here. Will that help? I think so, sir. Good boy. Now then, off we go. I'll carry the small bag, Father. Not too much for you, is it? Oh, no, sir. See? Fine. On to Staunton. Station. All out for Stolten. Number 36, River Road. There it is, Kit. See the sign? John Verity. Antiques. You better stay here for a moment. I'll run in and find out where we're going to bunk. It looks closed, Father. It can't be this time of day. Yes. Mr. Verity in, please? Oh, Mr. Verity died this morning. He died? It was very sudden. His heart. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I've just come down, you see. I was to be his assistant. Yes. He mentioned it the other day. But without him, there's nothing, of course. I'm sorry. What did she say, Father? Are they going to live away from the shop? Well, Mr. Verrett is dead, Kit. Died this morning. So Staunton's a washout. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, Father. Well, we'll just have to make the best of it. Are we going back to London, sir? Well, no, you see... Kit, let's go someplace where we can sit down. I'd like to have a talk with you. Yes, sir. And that's the way it is, son. We can't go back to London because we haven't any money. I thought you had a right to know since we're... Well, we're sort of partners, you know. I don't mind staying in the store, sir. Fine. And, Kit, I'm not going to bother about the crease in my trousers anymore. I mean keeping up appearances. I don't care what the job is, I'm going to get it. It may not be a gentleman's job, but we need it. Do you mind? No, sir. On a bright? On a bright. That's it, then. I was a little afraid you were going to be ashamed of me. I'd never be ashamed of you, sir. Yesterday and a long time before, I was sort of a shabby gentleman. But that's finished. From now on, we're going to make a living. It may not be much. Just bread and butter. I don't mind just bread and butter. No jam? No, sir. Uh, <laughs> jam makes you sick sometimes. <laughs> Somehow I think all this was worth it. At least you and I know where we are. And from now on, I'm going to tell you things, Kit. No more make-believe. And I'll tell you things too, Father. Everything. Fine. Now, suppose we find ourselves some diggings and I'll go out, look around for some work. There must be something. Yes, sir. And I'll unpack the bags while you're gone. Kit, I'm back. Kit. Coming, sir. Well, Father, was there anything, sir? I have a job, Kit. Oh, I'm glad. What is it? I'm a porter at the Angel Hotel. Captain Stephen Sorrell, M.C. So, you're our new porter. That's right. Mr. Porphy engaged me last night. Yes? Well, you might as well know first off that my husband doesn't engage anybody. I run this hotel. Oh, I understood it was definite. It's definite that we need a porter, but I'm not sure you're the type. I'd like the chance. What's your trouble, Ben? Is... Is that any business of yours? Mm, perhaps not, but you say you'd like this job. Are you married? Not now. But I have a boy. This will be rather a come down for you, won't it? That's my affair. What is the job, please? Well, of course, you're pretty raw. The main thing is you won't be able to put on any airs. 
The man who cleans the boots in my hotel doesn't put on airs. Point number one, I clean the boots. Mm, carry up the luggage. Yes. Keep an eye on the yard and the garage. Well, then there's the bar. You'll have to scrub that out every morning. I see. And lend a hand sometimes with the drinks. Right. Anything else? Oh, any odd job I may want done. And you will call me Madam. Very well. Madam? You'll live in, of course. And what about my boy, please? Oh, I'm not engaging a boy. You can put him out to board somewhere and he can go to school here in the town. Oh, but I'd planned on having him... It's up to you, Sorrow. I can fill this place ten times over in half an hour. Well, will you take it or won't you? I'll take it. Sorrow, room number seven wants cleaning. I was just finished number six, madam. I was talking about seven. I'll do it right away. See that you do, and wipe off the mirror. There's lipstick on it. Sorrow, the missus says you to carry up that trunk to number four. Yes, as soon as I'm done here, I can't do everything at once. I know. She's a hard one to satisfy. I've been married to her for ten years, and I know. Don't let her kill you, man. Sorrow, have you brought the greens in? In a minute, cook. I've got a trunk to carry up. Well, I can't start the supper till I get the greens. I know. I know. The ashtrays are full again, Sorrow. Sorrow, have you got a minute to sweep the floor? I need some help with the glasses, Sorrow. Ashtray, Sorrow. Floor, Sorrow. Glasses, Sorrow. Hurry, please. Don't let her kill you, man. Greens, please, and hurry. hurry Better up to it, Sorrow. Hop to it, hop to it. <laughs> The maid says that the window is... Sorry, Mr. Palfrey. I've got... I'm just on my way out. Got an hour off this afternoon. Oh. Well, you deserve it, Stephen. You deserve it. Thanks. Father, here I am. Hello, son. Let's see you. Well, looks as if Mrs. Barter's feeding you pretty well. Oh, yes, sir. Have you much time off? A whole hour. What about a walk? We could go down to the river, sir. The river it is. Come on. Father, is the work, I mean, is it hard up at the hotel? Oh, I'm getting used to it. That is hard, isn't it? Uh, it is a bit. Why? Oh, nothing. Well, shall we sit down, sir? I think I'm getting tired. <laughs> oh, you mean you think I'm tired, don't you? All right. Father? Mm hmm? You know it may not be so very long. What? I've been thinking about it. Night, you know. After school. Thinking about what? Well, I can start work at 15. I hope not, son. Why, Father? I'm going fast and... Kit, most people grow fast, too fast. Like cabbages. See that tree over there? It's beautiful, isn't it? Well, that tree wasn't in a hurry. And we're not going to be in a hurry. But with you working so hard and doing everything... I'd like to help, too. But you do. You see, your job is to go to school and learn things. Your job is to grow up strong and decent. So I'll never have to worry about you. My job? Well, my job is to see that you do your job. Is that too mixed up? No, sir. Only... Let's put it this way. I want you to have a chance. A good chance to do worthwhile things. If you get that chance, and if I can help make it for you, I'll be very happy. Oh, you'll hear a lot of talk about the school of hard knocks. I believe in it too, son, but don't ever get the idea that it's the only way to learn. You don't have to cut your hand to find out it'll bleed. And if you can learn through someone else, why, you're just so much ahead of the game. But, but I'll be learning through you. You'll be taking all the knocks for me. Well, oh, Kip, I haven't been a father so very long, and I can't be sure, but I have an idea that that's the way it should be. The Angel Hotel. Think this will do? It's a bit of a hole, but it's only for one night. I'm tired. Yes, you mentioned that before. Evening, sir. Evening, madam. Evening. Want a room, please? Best you have. Right, sir. Sorrow? Luggage. Coming. Where's the bar, please? Right inside, sir. For heaven's sake, Harry, do you have to start in right away? You started again, too. Let me alone. What room, Mr. Palfrey? Number three. Will you want all the bags, madam, or just... Well... Oh. No. 
Just the two small ones. Very good, madam. Bring them right away, please. Yes, madam. Just put them down anywhere. Well, how are you, Stephen? Very well. So you're the porter here. Yes. Well, forgive me for being surprised. It was something of a shock. My being a porter? Well, seeing you again. I was just a little glad that Harry had gone inside. By the way, would you like to be introduced to my second? How long are you staying here? Oh, just the night. Don't get windy, Stephen. Harry doesn't know you from Adam. We'll leave it at that. You've done quite well for yourself, I see. Yes, Harry's very generous. How's Kit? Didn't you hear me, Stephen? I said, how's Kit? Kit's very well, thank you. Is he here? No. At school? <laughs> You see, it's no use asking you. None at all. But I am his mother, you know. Isn't it always considered a mother's right to see her child? He must ask about me at times. He thinks you're dead. He thinks... That was hardly fair of you, Stephen. What would you have liked me to tell him? That his mother left me because she thought I was a weakling? Because I couldn't give her the nice, easy thing she wanted? That she divorced me because another man was better to... fit it, to care for her than I was? When you left Kit... And me. It was my job to bring him up. To do that, I needed his respect. I think I have it. Until he finds out that you lied to him. He will find out someday, you know. I hope he'll be old enough then to understand. Until that time, he won't need a mother. He'll have an ideal. Which I could hardly fulfill, I suppose. Well, you've settled it, I see. Temporarily, anyhow. You're not going to pretend that you miss him. I'll be honest. No, I, I haven't had time. You never had time, did you, Dora? I'll have to go. Goodbye. Wait, Stephen. Yes? Here, take this. It's for Kit. Buy him something nice. You won't have to mention me. Goodbye, Stephen. All set, sir, my lad. Sir. Oh, oh, yes, yes, I'm all set. Here. The lady gave me this. The lady? Why, it's... I say, two pounds. We'll split it, mate, I Half and half, eh, mate, I No, you can keep the lot. I don't need it. During this short intermission before Mr. DeMille brings you Herbert Marshall, Richard Carlson, and Karen Morley in Act Two of Sorrel and Son, we have a very important announcement to make, one that affects every woman in our audience. I know that millions of you have been using Lux Flakes every day for years, and I've heard plenty of you say how marvelous Lux is, what wonderful care it gives your washables. But that didn't satisfy us. We wanted to make Lux Flakes even more perfect. Women said it couldn't be done, because Lux was already so very, very good. But all the time they were talking, we were trying to figure out a way to do it. We couldn't make Lux any purer. We couldn't make it any safer. But there was one thing we could do. We could make it faster. And that's just what we've done. That's our big news for tonight. We've added a new ingredient that speeds up the action of Lux Flakes so that you get faster suds. And when I say faster, I mean just that. It's simply astounding how fast you get suds with new quick Lux. I wish you'd try it right away. Your dealer has it now, in the same familiar Lux box. I have tried it, Mr. Ruick, and I think it's simply marvelous. I could hardly believe my eyes the way it burst into suds the very minute I turned on the water. Well, no wonder, Sally. New Quick Lux is three times faster by actual test. In water as cool as your hand, New Quick Lux dissolves three times faster than any of ten other leading soaps tested. Flakes, chips beads, or bars. I can believe it. Why, I've never seen anything like it. You should see the suds I got. And ounce for ounce, new Quick Lux gives you more suds than any of the ten other soaps tested. A little goes so far. That's why we say new Quick Lux is so very thrifty. Why, it cost almost nothing to use. Faster suds and more suds. And the new Quick Lux has the same famous Lux safety you've always known. It certainly is grand. Well, there's no harmful alkali to hurt any color or fabric that's safe in plain water. It helps your stockings, underthings, dresses, blouses, and sweaters stay new-looking longer. I hope every one of you will try a new Quick Lux right away. It's simply marvelous. I know, because I've tried it. I think it's grand, and I'm sure you will, too. Remember, the Lux your dealer now carries is new Quick Lux. 
It comes in the same familiar Lux box. Ask your dealer tomorrow for a thrifty large box of new quick Lux. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act Two of Sorrel and Son, starring Herbert Marshall as Stephen Sorrel, with Richard Carlson, Karen Morley, and Clifford Severn, Jr. The months go by, and Sorrel, under the unaccustomed strain of physical work, grows thin and haggard, but his plans for Kit keep him doggedly at the job. Never faltering, never complaining. And now a bright spot appears on the dull horizon. A rather mysterious stranger at the inn. Thomas Rowland from London. Between Sorrel and the soft-spoken guest has grown a, a quiet bond of sympathy and understanding. Hello. Oh, morning, sir. What are you doing here, Sorrel? Tidying up, sir. Oh, I didn't mean in this room. I mean, what are you doing in this job? I have a boy. The job is a necessity. But a place like this? Yes, it must be. In the army, weren't you, Sorrel? Yes, sir. Any decorations? Military cross. <laughs> I got nothing but a mention in dispatches. What do you think of hotels, Sorrel? What, sir? Hotels, the Angel and a thousand others just like it. What do you think of them? I'd rather not say, sir. Neither would I. The drawers all stick, never enough towels, hot water variable, dust under the rugs... The kitchen's enough to turn a man's stomach. Then why live in them? Because I want to learn the things to be careful of when I open my hotel. I see. <laughs> Am I boring you? Not at all. It's called the Pelican, and I hope it'll be everything these hotels aren't. I'm putting all my capital into the show, and I'm being extraordinarily careful in picking my people. I want character, conscience, and pleasant faces. I'll pay good wages and feed my people well. I'll need two porters. Yes, sir. I have one already, a fellow named Buck. He'll be the head porter. Oh, yes, sir. My one piece of sentiment, this fellow Buck, an ex-sergeant major. He saved my life out there, and I owe him his chance. And now, what about it, Sorrel? Do you think my job might be better than this one? If you take me on, sir, I'll see that you don't regret it. It's only second porter. I realize that, but you'll give me a chance to get out of this hole. I'm grateful. They say gratitude is a slave virtue. Then call it goodwill, sir. Ah, that's it, Stephen. Every time. Coming, sir. Coming. Welcome to the Pelican, sir. There's a bag in the back, and I'll want the trunk off the carrier. Right you are, sir. Buck's my name, sir. Ed Porter. Anything you want, just let me know, sir. I'll need that trunk right away. Right you are, sir. Sorrel! Yes? Oh, here you are. Take the gentleman's trunk and step lively, Sorrel. He wants it right away. Step this way, sir. I've got you. Sorrel! Sorrel, you can't carry that thing up along. Here, let me help you. Look out, Mrs. Marks. Look oh, out. be careful. You know, Sorrel, this has got to stop. Here, sit down a moment and rest. Uh, I'm all right. But you're not all right. You've been doing Buck's work in your own ever since we opened. Oh, he's the first porter, Mrs. Marks. Well, that doesn't entitle him to sit around on. Well, it doesn't entitle him to a permanent vacation. This housekeeper here, I think, is my duty to tell Mr. Rowland. No, no, no. I'll work it out myself, Mrs. Marks. Oh, you'll kill yourself, you mean. Why, that Buck would kill anybody to get out of a little work he's mean. He thinks I'll break under it. But I won't. I'd rather die than give in to him. All right there, Sorrel. All right there. He's waiting for that trunk, you know. I'm getting it up as fast as I can. You don't look very busy now, my lad. I was resting. It's quite a load for one man. Oh, I wouldn't say that. It all depends on the man. If you ain't strong enough for this kind of work, you ought to say so. Well, step lively, man. You won't want to wait all day for it. The lazy lout. Probably pocketed the tip, too. Does he ever share his tips with you? No. No, he never... Look out, Mrs. Marks. I've got to get that trunk up. I'll get it up. If I break every bone in my body, I'll get it up. I'll get it up. Yes? 
It's uh, Stephen, Mrs. Marks. Why, Stephen, what's wrong? I hate to disturb you this time of night. I wondered if you might have some sleeping pills or something. Are you ill, Stephen? That's nothing. I... A little long... pain in my side. How long have you had it? Just this evening. Uh, you've hurt yourself with those trunks. I knew you would. Well, I'm going to call the doctor. No, no, please. It's not that bad. I'm going to just the same. Mrs. Marks, is that you? It's Mr. Mr. Rowland. What's the matter? Sorry. Anything wrong? Oh, Stephen's sick, Mr. Rowland, and, and he won't let me call the doctor. Oh, oh, it's nothing at all. I just... Let me see you. He's pale as a ghost, sir. Go back to your room, Sorrel. I'll have Dr. Harvey in. Oh, but it's only... Uh, run along, will you? Uh, just a place safe. Very well, sir. Thank you. Do you have Harvey's number, Mrs. Marks? It ought to be in this book. Mr. Rowland, uh, I've been meaning to tell you about Sorrel. I know, Mrs. Marks. About his not being strong? No, about Buck's share of the work. I do see things, Mrs. Marks. I'm not asleep. Oh, I wondered, sir. Now, let's have that number. Nothing very serious, Sorrel. You may have to take it easy for a little while. I'll try, Doctor. If you're not feeling any better tomorrow, come and see me. Is there anything I can do, sir? Oh, hello. Your boy, Sorrel? Yes. It looks like you. Fine boy. Is there anything, sir? Well, now, let's see. You might make sure he takes his medicine regularly. Yes, sir. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Splendid. Well, good night. Good night, Doctor. Good night, sir. Do you feel... Better, Father? Well, of course. You always feel better after you have a doctor in, didn't you know that? No, sir. Is that true? Well, now I really think of it, I believe it is. With most doctors, anyway. It's the unknown that makes people feel bad. Now, I had a nasty pain. It worried me. Doctor came in and saw it wasn't so serious, and... Well, here I am, feeling better. He was nice. I liked him. Did you? So did I. It must be nice being a doctor. I mean... Making people well. Yes? I should think they'd like it ever so much with everybody sort of a depending on them. They must feel pretty fine when a sick person gets well again. You know, Father, I think I'd like to be a doctor. Do you? Well, we'll have to talk some more about this, son. <laughs> All right. What about them barrels now? I've been moving them out all morning. All morning for a few barrels of ashes. <laughs> it's a posh job you've got here, my lad. Those places I'd work where the second porter had moved them barrels in ten minutes or move out. Perhaps the second <laughs> porter had help. What's that? Now, perhaps in the places you've worked, the second porter received some share of the tips. What do you mean by that? Come on now, what do you mean? I seem to miss most of the tips. That's not my fault, my lad. If people don't pass it over to you, there must be a reason. Yes, I expect there is. They pool their tips in the dining room and the chambermaids pool theirs. Do you think I'd pool with the chap what works under me? I've sweated for my position, my lad. And I don't share out with the boot boy. I do all the work. I'm entitled to something. To the back of me end, if you don't mind your tongue. If you don't like it, you can leave. I won't leave. I need this job. And I also need the money that's coming to me. If you... That's the thing you've had coming, my lad. You, you... More, is it? You want more, do you? All right, my lad. See how you like this. Oh, oh Mr. Rowan, Mr. Rowan. Sorrel, Buck, stop it, stop it, I tell you. Get up, Sorrel. What's this all about? It, it was him started it, sir. He struck me, sir. Uh, I'm sorry I had to treat him a bit rough, sir. Go into the office, Buck. I yes, want to sir. speak to you. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Sorrel. Yes, I'm sorry, Sorrel, but I had to be sure about Buck. Not sure about... Did you think I was asleep, too? I've given him the chance I promised him. Sorry it took so long. Evening, Father. Look, kid. Evening, Father. Father, what's happened to your face? Oh, just a couple of scratches. I've news for you, son. Buck's gone. I'm head porter at the Pelican. Really, sir? Oh, well, it's not that important. But it'll make a difference. I'll be able to give you something better than the town school now. Something that may be a better preparation for medicine, you know. I had an idea that St. Benedict might be just the thing for you. You don't ever think of yourself, sir? Oh, I'm only a means to an end. 
I've got an object in life. I'm to be envied. I know how hard you work. I'll try not to waste your money, sir. Come in. Evening, Sorrel. Evening, sir. Sit down. How's the boy? I had a letter from him yesterday. He's doing quite well at St. Benedict's. Take a few days off and run up and see him. Oh, thank you. You'll need a bit of a vacation before you take over your new job. New job? I suppose you've saved a little money, Sorrel. Yes, I... Yes, I have a few hundred pounds. It's for Kit. Well, let's talk business. The Pelican has paid well. I'm going to open a second place and perhaps later a third. The obvious thing is to turn the whole show into a company with shares held by a few interested people. The Roland Hotels. How's that strike you? It should be a sound idea. So I think. And as you will be running the Pelican, I shall want you on the board, of course. Oh, you mean me to... to manage here? Yes. <laughs> well, it's a big jump from head porter to manager. A very big jump. Well, shall we drink to it? Thank you. I'm still a bit flabbergasted. Here you are. To the Roland Hotel, sir. To the new manager of the Pelican. Yes? Excuse me, Mr. Roland. Of course. Stephen, Kit is here, Stephen. What? Kit, he's in your room. He came down from school in the bus. Is he sick? I don't believe so. Well, what is... Will you excuse me, sir? Sir. Hello, Father. Quite a surprise seeing you here. Yes, sir. You've left the school? Yes, sir. Sit down. I don't see your bags. I left them up there. But I'd rather not go back, sir. I want to stay on here. I could take private coaching, sir, or go back to the council school in town. Please, Father, let me stay. I always thought St. Benedict was a pretty fine place, Kit. What happened? Studies too hard? No, sir. The masters aren't down on you? No, sir. Then why? Of course, if you'd rather not tell it's me. It's the boy, sir. They don't like me, and I don't like them. It's no use going to school someplace where you... where you don't get along, is it, sir? That's why I want to stay here. I'd like it ever so much better. Look at me, Kit. You're running away from something, aren't you? I don't know what it is, and I won't press you. But I do know that turning tail won't solve it. You can't solve anything that way. You've got to face it. And fight it. I think you agree with that, don't you? Yes, sir. What is it, son? Can't you tell me? They wanted to know about you, sir. They wanted to know what you did. For a living? Yes, sir. I see. And what did you tell them? I said... I said you were head porter at the Pelican. Good boy. I'm not ashamed of it, sir. I'm not. Of course you're not. And you've won your fight already, don't you see? you faced the hard part of the task. Now go back and finish it. See it through. You've got to, son. For me. Understand? For me. Very well, sir. I'll go back. In the next of our graduates is a young man who leaves St. Benedict's with several of our most coveted honors. He is to enter Cambridge in the autumn. Will Mr. Christopher Sorrell step forward, please? I'm proud of you, Chip. I'm proud of you. Luggage, please. Room 18. Will you be staying long, madam? I'm not sure. By the way, the manager here is a Mr. Sorrell, isn't he? Yes, madam. I wonder if you'd ask him to see me later in my room. Of course, madam. Thank you so much. Might as well sit down, Stephen. How long have you been manager here? About four years. You're not even surprised to see me. I was on the porch when you drove up. Oh, then you haven't read the register. Is there a surprise there? Oh, you're married again. Yes. I was Sam Pitts. Now I'm Duggan. Mr. Duggan died last December. I suppose I shall remain Duggan. Is it necessary? Oh, really, that's very gallant of you, Stephen. Not at all. I'm grayer than you are. You're older than I am. That's not quite so gallant. Well, we meet once more. But not by accident. This time. No. You're very clever, Stephen. I wanted to have a talk with you, so I looked you up. You don't mind, Stephen? Certainly not. Funny thing, life. Here we are like a couple of strangers. Do you remember those days at Shanklin? 
Our honeymoon? Nearly 20 years ago. And therefore dead. You've never forgiven me, have you? Poor Stephen. You married an explosive person. But when a woman comes to a certain stage, she begins to look back instead of forward. You think so? Of course, it depends, but a woman grows rather lonely. You're talking about Kit, aren't you? I'd like to know my son. I'd like him to know me. You think it's to his advantage? Oh, I do. I've got money. Everything I want. I can have him help him have whatever he may want. He's at Cambridge now. In a few years, he'll be a physician. The thing he wants to do more than anything else in the world. I can help him there, too. I have friends, Stephen. Rich friends. They make good patients. Do you think you can buy your son back after all this time? There's little to be lost by trying. And then there's my side of the story, too, you know. He may be interested in that. He doesn't know mine yet. Then he still thinks... You must be quite mad, Stephen. He still doesn't know. No. Then I think it's time he did. Or are you afraid? No, daughter. I'm not afraid. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille brings you Act Three of Sorrel and Son with Herbert Marshall, Richard Carlson, and Karen Morley. Out in Glendale this morning, a young bride rushed breathlessly to the telephone. Operator, operator, quick. Give me main 70201. Mother? Oh, hello, darling. Look, I've only a moment, but I've got to tell you the good news. You know how wonderful Lux is. Well, you ought to try it now. What's different? It dissolves faster, so much faster. It's simply gorgeous. It suds in a second. Honestly, so fast, you'd never believe it. Uh, call up the grocer right now and order a box of the new Quick Lux. You'll be thrilled to death. Good news has a way of traveling like wildfire. And that's the way the news about new Quick Lux flakes is spreading. One woman tries it and tells another. They all say the same thing. They thought Lux flakes were so wonderful they couldn't be improved. But we've done it. Lux was so very fine, we couldn't make it purer or safer. But we could make it faster. The Lux Flakes your dealer now has is this wonderful new Quick Lux in the same familiar box. It contains a marvelous new ingredient that speeds up the suds. Why, they're so fast, they bubble up as soon as you turn on the water. In water as cool as your hand, new Quick Lux dissolves three times faster than any of ten other leading soaps tested. And, ounce for ounce, new Quick Lux gives you more suds than any of the ten other soaps tested. That's why it goes further. In fact, a little goes so far you'll find new Quick Lux is thrifty, very thrifty. And it has the same marvelous safety that's made it famous for years. There's no harmful alkali to hurt any color or fabric that's safe in plain water. Buy a thrifty large box of new Quick Lux tomorrow, and we're willing to wager you'll be telling your friends about it, too. It's so fast, so thrifty, and so safe. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We continue our play, Sorrel and Son. Two days have passed, and Sorrel has gone to Cambridge to see Kit. In the quiet dormitory room, the late afternoon sun streams through the open window, where Sorrel stands looking across the campus. He and Kit have been silent for some time almost unwilling to break the hush of the waning day. I suppose you knew I had a reason for coming. Well, I, I didn't quite expect you, sir. It's almost train time, so I'll have to tell you quickly. I'd rather you didn't speak, Kit. Just listen and think it over when I'm gone. What is it, Father? A long time ago, son, we said we'd have no secrets. Well, I haven't quite lived up to that bargain. Ever since you were a child, I've told you, or let you believe, rather, that your mother was dead. 
Well, your mother isn't dead. I spoke to her two days ago. Father! Please, son. I realize this is a shock for you. But you mustn't think that because I've never mentioned her that, that there was anything wrong. We just didn't get along together, that's all. She divorced me right after the war. You were too young to know what it was all about, and I didn't try to explain. I'm not certain now that I was right in handling it that way, but at the time it seemed best. That's my only excuse, kid. You can judge it for yourself after you've had time to think it over. Your mother wants to see you, kid. It's going to be hard on you. Just remember, this is just as hard for her. Right now, there's nothing more I can say or tell you. I know you'll be fair. Goodbye, son. Dear father, my mother came to see me today. It's very strange to hear myself call her mother. We talked for a while, and she invited me to her house in London. She's having some people up to spend a few days. I can't make up my mind whether I should go or not. My dear boy, go by all means if you wish. You owe it to her and yourself. After all, she is your mother and she was my wife. I know she will never come between us. Kit, dear, may I come in? Of course. I was afraid you'd gone to bed, dear. No, I... I'm not sleepy, Mother. Just reading. I do hope you're having a good time, darling. Did you enjoy the dance? I invited Lola Meriden specially for you. She's... She's very attractive. Yes, the little devil... She just told me in the drawing room that she thinks you're the most charmingly naive person she's ever met. Really? Oh, well, never mind, Lola, now. She's had you all evening. Right now, you belong to me. And tomorrow, I have a wonderful day planned for all of us. I'm afraid I've got to leave tomorrow. Oh, darling, there's no hurry. Well, I, I have my work, you know. I'm rather keen on it. Oh, yes, of course. You're going to be tremendously clever as a surgeon, Kit. I know it. Oh, I see you. I see you've even brought your books. It looks wonderfully technical. Tell me about your work, Kit. Well, there's nothing to tell. I, I hope to be practicing in a few years. I'll send you all my friends. Well, I, I rather planned on hospital work for quite a while. It's good training. I see. Go on. Why, well, I'm afraid that's all. It's horrible. We seem like strangers. I'm sorry. I don't see how it can be helped. Oh, Kit. I know I must seem all wrong to you. I do, don't I? No, it's... It's just, I've been so long with Father. We, are, we understand each other. I mean... I know what you mean. I'm an outsider. It's just you and him together. But I can understand, too. You've got to give me a chance. I want you with me. I've always wanted you. You're my boy, kid. My son. Do you know what that means? You're my son. Please. He's poisoned you against me. He's filled your mind with lies and deceit. He's made you see only his side. What about mine? It wasn't my fault that I couldn't love him. It wasn't my fault that he wasn't strong enough to fight a man's battle. Now I've got to suffer for it. You're leaving me. You're going back to him. I've got to go back. No, no, you're my son. I want you here. I want you with me. I'm sorry, Mother. I'm really very sorry. Hello, Father. Nice to have your bag, son. Thanks. Well, enjoy yourself? No, not very much. Oh, sorry. I don't believe... I don't think I'll go up there again, Father. Just as you like, son. And here is some great news, Father. When I'm graduated in June, I'll have a job already waiting for me. The St. Martha's Hospital in London... I'm to work under Sir Henry Orange, who, as you know, is quite famous in surgery. I think this calls for something of a celebration. Do you? 
to Christopher Sorrell, M.D. To Captain Stephen Sorrell, M.C., who made it all come true. <laughs> How's the work? Marvelous. There's so much to be learned, it frightens me. But Sir Henry's encouraging. Not working too hard, are you? I don't think so. Why, sir? I thought you looked a little drawn. A surgeon has his problems, sir. Especially a young one. I dare say. It's a comfort to know I can turn to someone for advice. Sir Henry. And you. Me. I imagine you're a little grown up for my advice now. You're on your own. Yes. That's what makes it so difficult. Oh, well, then there is something that... All right, son, I'll do my best. Is it a woman? I thought you'd know. She's a nurse at the hospital. It could very easily interfere with your job, couldn't it? I suppose so. Is that the most important thing? It all depends. Probably not. Look, Father, it's not just this girl. There's nothing serious yet. It's it's just, well, women in general. It didn't bother me so much up at Cambridge, but down here in London... Yes, I know. It's like going about hungry and seeing a basket of fruit at every corner. I suppose it's pretty low of me. I've been through it too, Kit. It isn't low. But it can be. Low and mean and cheap. But I see beauty in woman, Father. I know that can't be wrong. Look, son. Go on seeing beauty in woman. That's the way of life, and it's a good and natural way. And just try to remember this. Don't ever hurt anybody. I understand, sir. <laughs> I can sit here and advise you over and over. Still, I went and married the wrong woman. And yet she gave me you. It's a hopeless muddle, isn't it? But if I had it all over again, I'd say to myself, don't hurry. It's the hurry that makes things go smash. Our own hungry haste. Besides, you know, there must always be one right woman. I suppose so. And I have a sort of feeling that one owes something to her. Stick fast to that idea, son. It's a good one. Dear Father, you were right as always. A few years ago, you told me there was one right woman. I'm bringing her to see you soon. Her name is Molly Pentry. Do you, Christopher Sorrow, take this woman as your lawful wife to love, honor, and cherish till death do you part? I do. Do you, Molly Pentry, take this man... Come in, dear. We're almost ready to leave. I'll come down and see you off. You're going to make him very happy. You know that, don't you, Molly? I'm going to try. Oh, we've wonderful plans for the honeymoon. I don't think there's a place we're going to miss. Thanks so much for it. No, it's just a bribe. So you'll learn to like your father-in-law. I think I learned to like him a long time ago. When I learned to love Kit. You're very sweet, Molly. Father, are you coming down? Come along. You'll have to learn not to keep your husband waiting, young lady. Goodbye, Father. Thanks for everything. Goodbye, son. Have a good time. Goodbye, Molly. Goodbye. We'll write every day. I won't expect it. <laughs> well, there goes your partner, Soddle. It'll be a long time before they're back. You are... Oh. I say, Soddle, what's the matter? Oh, it's just... Just the old pain. It'll be gone in a moment. Come inside, man. You're sick. No, just let me hold on a moment. I don't want to be the ghost at the feast. Hello? Did you see the doctor? Yes, I just spoke to him. Now, uh, don't try to get up. Why didn't you tell us, Sorrel? How long have you been sick? I saw old Harvey about a year ago. He was very kind to me. He didn't tell me the truth. But I think I knew. Soddle, I'm going to write to Kit. He ought to be here. No, no, not yet. There's time yet. I don't want to spoil anything. And Roland... Yes? Don't worry about it. I'll let you know when to tell him. Cable to Mr. Christopher Sorrell, Hotel du Pre, Le Havre, France. Your father ill. Advise you return at once. Signed, Roland. Roland. 
How is he? He's very sick, Molly. Will he... He's going to live. We'll have to operate. After that, there's no telling. But he'll never be well again? Not really well? No. Oh, kid. A man has to live. That's medicine. That's a doctor's job to keep the body alive at any price. Keep it moving. Keep it breathing. Kid. That's all right. I'm not losing my grip. I mustn't now. Kid. Yes? He wants to see you alone. Very well. Father? Is that you, kid? Yes. Anything I can do? I don't... I don't think so. Father, why didn't you tell me? I should have known the day of the wedding, but when I asked you, you, you said... I lied to you. I broke the bargain again, son. And you let me go off like, like a blind fool. It was my pleasure. Don't spoil it for me. Kid. Yes? I'm asking you to keep the bargain. How long would you say I had? Father, please. Come, son, we've faced everything together. I'm not afraid of this. How long? We're going to operate tonight. Sir Henry should be here any minute. He's been very successful with this sort of thing. How long, kid? A month? Three months? A year at the most, eh? I... I don't know, sir. I'll be an invalid, won't I? Yes. Don't look so miserable, kid. I expected it. But now... I want to ask a favor. It's a great favor, kid. One that will take all your courage. Yes. Kid. Nature has a way of dealing with the old and the sick. And with people in pain. It's a kind way sometimes. She lets them die. Father. Don't operate, kid. But don't keep me alive in pain and suffering. Father, you don't know what you're saying. But I do, son. I told you it would take all your courage. I want you to have the courage to let me die now. Before pain has taken everything human out of me. Father, I can't do that. I can't. Kid, listen to me. I'm an old man. My work is done. And I'm tired. I could sleep now. The pain's gone a little. But tomorrow it'll be there again. And the day after. And the day after that. I know what I'm asking. It's the greatest thing and the hardest thing I've ever asked of you. But please don't fail me. Let me sleep, kid. Let me rest. Please. All right, Father. Thank you, my boy. If you don't mind, I'll... I'll close my eyes. Now. Perhaps I'll dream a little. It'll be a good dream. Peaceful. Shall I... Shall I... Turn out the light, sir. Yes. Thank you. Good night, Father. Good night, son. Well, kid. Will you call Sir Henry, Mr. Rowland? Tell him not to come, please. Kid, is he? Oh, kid, tell me. He's all right now. He's. He's going to sleep. The curtain falls on the last act of Sorrel and Son. In a moment, our stars return for a curtain call. A new year starts today, and we hope that it brings peace and prosperity and all manner of good things to you and your family. It seems especially fitting on the first day of the year to bring you the news of new Quick Lux Flakes because this new improved product will make your tasks easier in 1940. We want you to try new Quick Lux tomorrow and see for yourself how really wonderful it is. New Quick Lux is faster. It suds in a second. In water as cool as your hand, 
New Quick Lux dissolves three times faster than any of ten other leading soaps tested. And you get such quantities of rich, active suds. By actual test, you get more suds, ounce for ounce, than from any other soap tested. That's why we say a little goes so far. New Quick Lux is thrifty. Thrifty for all the soap and water tasks you have every day. It's safe for everything, safe in plain water. Your pretty frocks, sweaters, blouses, and dainty underthings stay new-looking longer because new Quick Lux has no harmful alkali to fade washable colors or fabrics. The Lux Flicks your dealer now carries is new Quick Lux in the familiar Lux package. Ask him for a large box of new Quick Lux the first thing tomorrow morning. Now Mr. DeMille is bringing our stars back to the microphone. I can't think of a better way to start the new year than welcoming three people like Herbert Marshall... Richard Carlson and Karen Morley back to our stage for a curtain call. Made any resolutions yet, C.B.? Yes. I've resolved that you won't be permitted to take such a long vacation from this microphone in 1940. Have you made any resolutions, Bob? No, I didn't make any, and so far I've kept them all. <laughs> what about you, Karen? Well, I've resolved to develop my automobile manners, 1940. I'm going to be absolutely as polite driving a car as I would be, well, in talking to a producer. <laughs> the Emily Post of the traffic jam, huh? Richard, let's hear from you. I'll nominate Karen for Woman of the Year if she sticks to that resolution. I've been wondering how this business of celebrating New Year's started. An old historian like you ought to know, Mr. DeMille. Well, contrary to the popular belief, it was it was not a nightclub proprietor who began it, but one of the old Roman emperors. Well, he's probably turning over in his catacomb right now, wondering how they get so many people out to see the gladiators in the Rose Bowl. Well, if it hadn't been for the emperor, we'd have had one less holiday, so here's to him. Even if his gladiators didn't have the box office draw of USC and Tennessee. By the way, Mr. DeMille, what's the draw in the Lux Radio Theater next week? Next Monday night, we're going to present the two stars who won the two Academy Awards last year. Spencer Tracy and Betty Davis. Our play is Dark Victory. It's the dramatic love story of a brilliant doctor and a society girl who learns that money won't buy everything. With Betty Davis and Spencer Tracy in the leading roles, Dark Victory will be brought to you by two of the finest dramatic artists of our day. That calls for a red letter on the calendar, C.B. Good night and a happy new year. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. May, may this new year be happier than the happiest new year you've ever had. city apartments and snowbound farmhouses, the fine old American custom of open house has been king today. It's a friendly tradition, and we always think of the Lux Radio Theater as an open house to you, not only on this New Year's Monday night, but on every Monday night through the whole year. Our wish for you is a full measure of joy and prosperity in 1940. Our promise to you is that we'll try to add to your happiness with an increasingly high standard of entertainment in the Lux Radio Theater. And our feeling for you, whoever you are and wherever you may be, is real friendship sealed with a national handshake. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Betty Davis and Spencer Tracy in Dark Victory. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in tonight's play were Eric Snowden as Roland, Vernon Steele as Buck, Mary Gordon as Mrs. Marks, Claire Vadera as Mrs. Palfrey, Kathleen Fitz as Molly, Thomas Mills as Mr. Palfrey, Gloria Gordon as Mrs. Verity, Jack Lewis as Sam Fitz, Dr. Severn as Dr. Harvey, and Thomas Freebairn Smith as hotel clerk. Richard Carlson will soon be seen in the RKO release, And So Goodbye. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.